Welcome back, everybody. I am Lynn Gilliland. This is Lessons from Leaders, and I'm so excited to have Morgan Lance here. Uh, she has such a Morgan. You have such an interesting story about following a founding CEO and and uh, and also leading through COVID and being a new CEO yourself. So there's lots to unpack here. I just want to let everyone know that Morgan is based in the Bay Area in California, and they uh, this is the time period that they're having w- weather. So she is. Uh, things might happen. We might hear thunder. We might lose electricity, or she just might be shocked by the big hail that's falling down. So just <laughs> that is going on right now. It might be it, we may or may not find it um, part of our podcast today. But anyway, Morgan, so glad you could be here with us today. Thank you, Lynn. I'm very delighted to to be here and have this time to talk with you. So let's just jump in both feet and. You did. You are the following a founding CEO, and that has its own joys and uh, stressors or learning. So, what were some of the discoveries that you have had? Well, you know, I found I followed a not just a founding CEO, but an incredibly dynamic founding CEO, um, much loved by our whole team um, and by our partners. And it was daunting coming in following her. Uh, I knew that um, I couldn't be another version of her. Uh, One thing I I told our board right away was, I'm not Jenny 2.0. I can't be Mm. her. All I can be is Morgan. And it's gonna be a different type of leadership that I will bring. But what I was really, very, very dedicated to doing was making sure that I continued the thread that Jenny started in our organization in terms of values and mission and haven't wavered from either of those um, in any way, even though the way I I lead is a little bit different. So as I recall, when we talked earlier, that was, um, you had to come to that Maybe you saw that in the beginning, but then there was also some you inner work of coming to realize that you did have to find your own way. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I was very, very blessed to be able to work with a coach during this transition. And we took a look at how the organization had been structured under our founder. And it was very much structured um as a family, you know, the, the organization was her baby quite literally. And, um, you know, we work with babies, so it's an, it's an apt, um, analogy. Um, and I knew that I couldn't replace the mom of this family. That's not who I was. Um, so I had to kind of think of a different role for myself. And I remember one day spending some time with, with our coach, um, we took a walk and she said, you know, think about, what this organization could be if the if the descriptor wasn't a family. I said, mm. It would be a team. And then she asked what my role would be. And I said, my role would be the coach. My role would be to find the best players for the team, to make sure that our trainings were, you know, well thought out and that everybody knew their role on the team and that we were all working towards one goal. And then to help the team members each be the very best versions of themselves. Um, and so that's really what I've tried to embody during my time as CEO at One Sky is the coach of the winning team. I like that phrase too, the coach of the winning team. And do you talk about that with your staff? Do, do you say, this is the way I see my role? I do actually. I was I was really deliberate in making sure they understood that I wasn't trying to take Jenny's place, that I could mm. never take Jenny's place. You know, she is the source of this organization. And she always will be. The best that I could do was to move us into our next chapter as as the coach. And I actually had a conversation last night with one of our team leads who said, you know, over the last two years. I have felt you lifting me up as a leader in the organization, and that's made me so much more confident. Um, and I think it's made things work more more efficiently. And and that's exactly what I was hoping for, was to be able to again that team analogy, look at each team member as a player on the team and what they need to do to to be their very best in their roles. Um, so I think it, I think it's. Working. <laughs> that must have been though. So I like if that's your aspiration. 
And that's the feedback you get. That must have, I think if it was me, I would start wanting to cry. Oh my God. Cause we don't always, <laughs> we don't always create what we have or not able to in our, what we see in our mind's eye. Yeah, uh, it did. It, it, it did almost make me cry. And I'll also say that it hasn't all been perfect, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are still members of our team that, you know, kind that, that clearly miss those earlier days when there was more of, a, of um, you know, a mother figure in the organization, someone who was, you know, making clearly, um, the decisions, whereas I tend to be a little bit more collaborative in decision making, and and that's still not comfortable for some of our team members, and so I have to check myself too and make sure that I'm also providing the kind of leadership that the organization needs, which may not always be um, completely in line with what feels what feels natural to me. But there's this fine line between what the organization needs, like the people need and your authentic style and what your strengths are. And then how do you drive that to the mission, the purpose? So that's all this balancing, right? Of like not straying too far to what your strengths are and still helping the staff, well, who, the people who need something different from you and still seeing, are you checking yourself? Are you still getting to where you're supposed to be getting to? It's like a little, I see like a little juggling act, like you got a plate and then you got another plate and that's, does it feel like that? Oh, it definitely feels like that. It absolutely feels like that. And I'm sure that I, I, stray too far to one extreme or the other as you know as a new as a new ceo while i'm while i'm finding my way but we have um we have a mantra at one sky um when we don't know what to do we always ask what's best for the kids mm. and that's what i constantly do you know when there's tough decisions to be made or moments of leadership that I know are going to be difficult for me, I always go back to that question is, you know, what is best for the kids that we serve? What is best for the children? What decision do I need to make now? Or what do I need to do or embody in order to move the mission forward? And that's a really clear, um, you know, that's a really clear decision maker for me. And it makes things a lot easier when in doubt. Yeah, I'm writing it down. What I like about that is in essence, you keep saying, what's our purpose? What's our purpose? What's our purpose? And make decisions from that, from that place. Like what will help us move toward that? Yes. Um, and what might stray too, too far away. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I'm pausing with that because I, it's so, um, easy to get away from that and get lost in, you know, are we raising enough money? Does this person like me? Is the board member happy with me? Whatever the other things are. And um, it's, I think that's just natural. But so I like that, that practice of what's best for the kids, what's best for the kids. I like that. Very simple. Yeah. And, and you do, let, yeah, go ahead, please. I was going to say, we do, you know, we do find there, there are definitely moments when, as for instance, a leadership team discussing a, a particular challenge, we'll find ourselves so deep in, in the weeds and, and, you know, I'll kind of pop us back out and, and just repeat that phrase, what's best for the children. And everybody knows, everybody knows mm -hmm. about what is best. And it kind of clears the decks of everything else. Yep. I'm going to uh, keep remembering that one. It's, and it's simple too. That that's yeah. helpful. So it's, yeah. Uh, also, so I know you led during, you were in the hot seat during COVID, right? During the, 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 well, we're, <laughs> who knows where we are, but we, um, in the beginning in the difficult part of COVID, right? Had you been in the CEO for long when you, when that happened? No, not at all. Um, so I became CEO in January of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's been two years really of, of um, leading through COVID. And we're an organization that 
uh, implements programs in countries that were very much impacted by COVID restrictions. So we saw a lot of program closure for for you know almost two years, um, and or restrictions of the number of of people we could be interacting with at particular times in our centers. So it was hard. It was a really difficult um, moment to come into a new role, ex- especially because I was essentially leading from afar uh, at One Sky. We have a small team here in the U.S. It's, it's mostly fundraising and communications, but all of our programs teams are in mainland China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and Mongolia. And so for the f- first two years, really, that I was CEO, I was you know, communicating with those teams through Zoom, wow. through email, WhatsApp. Right. Um, last fall, I was able to finally go visit our program sites in person, and it was such a wonderful moment to be on the ground um, with our team leaders who um, did an amazing job holding things together without a lot of, um, you know, direct support through those years. And so what are some of your learnings from, from leading through that time, either like how you need to lead or what you learned about leading others because it, it did definitely put everything on its head. You know, what we used to think was needed, sometimes it looks like it wasn't needed because we learned we could get along without it. That was one of the things I was thinking about. What definitely. did you learn? Definitely. A couple things. One, um, just the importance of not assuming people are okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pandemic really affected from what I saw in our organization, people very differently depending on where they were based. Um, and so not to assume that just because you know things were looking better in the US at a particular time, it would be the same in Mongolia or China, not to assume that because some staff um, had COVID and recovered quickly meant that all staff would. We've got still staff members out on disability with long COVID. So not making assumptions about the way the pandemic would affect the team because it was very different from region mm-hmm. individual to individual. Um, and so I had to, you know, I shouldn't say I had to, I wanted to really make time to listen mm-hmm. to the needs of the team and to be able to respond to them um, as individuals. The other thing that I learned was we needed to innovate quickly. We could not simply wait for the world to get better, uh, for funding to pick back up, for countries that were in lockdown to open back up. We just couldn't wait. The children needed us. And Mm -hmm. so we had to innovate very quickly. We had to find ways to reach the populations we were working with uh, online. And sometimes that meant... um, expanding to even, you know, really, really low tech solutions like text in some cases, because we were working in some communities that didn't have sufficient internet. Um, So being able to take what was once a really structured in-person training program for caregivers of of vulnerable children and quickly innovate to online um, Mm -hmm. delivery methods was, was a big learning for us. And what ended up happening was we were able to do a little bit of uh, measurement of the impact of those programs and found that really we hadn't lost much by going online. And so now it's really changed our entire model of working because we're realizing we could probably reach a lot more caregivers and thus children through online training um, without losing any of that quality, which is something we had always feared. And how do you, I love that story. So how do you bring that level of innovation? How do we not lose that now that you can travel now that, you know, for many, many places, it's quote unquote back to normal. I know China is its own special thing, but how do we, how do we not lose being innovative? Like we were able to be in during that time period. Yeah, I, that's a really, really good question. And I'm not sure I have I have the answer other than knowing that it's part of my role to make sure that we stay innovative. Um, mm-hmm. I actually just, um, just recently was talking with one of our programs teams in one of the countries and saw that um, 
we had kind of slipped back into all direct training. And I thought, no, 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 no. Let's at least keep, you know, some piece of this online um, training that we that we developed going because we never know when we're going to need it or we're going to want to expand it or, um, you know, COVID, COVID raises its head again in, in a way that creates a, a challenge in that particular country and we have to go back to online training. So I take that as my role as the CEO to make sure that we maintain that innovation and that innovative spirit. But I do think it's easy to lose it and become complacent again. I think it's just, you know, we go back into what's normal and comfortable. And yeah. it's like the river going back into the its little or the creek going back into its banks. Um, Great. So how do we stay out of that, you know? And you're you're not the only one that I spoke with. Everybody has this. Well, we were so innovative; it was so amazing. And now let's just everybody's starting to shift. Many are starting to shift back into what the way we used to do things. And so I hate to see us lose that innovativeness that happened because we had to be innovative. So I agree. And what I like about what you're saying is you take it on yourself to kind of be the watch dog watchtower for that um yeah so when you look back at your now you're you've been in the ceo seat for coming on two years right two Woo-hoo. years yeah, yeah two years <laughs> so you look back at that and you say what did you you know now that you would have told yourself at the beginning of taking on that uh, that assignment, that job as the CEO, what do you see now that you didn't see then? Wow, goodness, a couple things. I would say, um, one, that there is a certain, um, there's a certain authority that comes with title. You know? mm implicit with title, but not completely, you know, um, just having the title CEO doesn't make you the CEO in the eyes mm. of a team that had been founder led for so long. So what I learned was that it takes a long time to build that trust with team members who we're already colleagues. I had been with the organization for many years um, in a different role. So I knew the team well, but it's a it's a really different thing to step up into that CEO role and to lead, um, you know, both kind of vertically and horizontally. Um, mm-hmm. So that was that was a big piece that I learned. Um, another thing that that I learned was the speed with which decisions need to be made at the CEO level is quite different mm. than at other leadership levels within an organization. Um, and so the luxury of being able to take my time to really think things through uh, isn't there to the extent that it used to be. I'm often in a position where I'm, you know, brought information from the team who needs a, who needs a decision made right away. And I have to be able to make it quickly. So that was a big learning for me because I'm I'm a person who tends to mull things over and really mm. want to gather all the information. And um, and I can't do that. I can't do that to the same extent now. So that was a big learning. Um, and it was interesting when I was working with the coach on my transition, she told me something really interesting, which was leaders are remembered for the pace at which they make decisions, not necessarily the outcome of those decisions. And I thought, Mm. crazy, obviously, if I make the wrong decision, I'm not going to be a good leader. And she said, no, actually, just making the the decision is an action of leadership. Um, And then being able to deal with the consequence, um, whether it be, you know, good or not. So that was an interesting learning for me. It shifts it from I have to make the right decision to I have to make a decision and then we'll manage whatever yeah. is the consequences. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Any tips for other people following founding CEOs? Like, what do you know now that you could share? I think right from the beginning, just making it clear that you're not trying to replace the founder, mm. that you'll never replace the founder. The founder of an organization, you know, always, you know, by just sort of definition of the word, had some sort of personal connection that caused them to create this program or this organization. And the person who comes in after will never have that same level of connection. So just acknowledging that up front, letting people know that you're not trying to be the founder uh, 2.0, that you're going to bring a different level of, of interest and leadership to the organization, I think is really important. I also feel that it's incredibly important for when possible for the founder to continue to have a role within the organization. And it's very interesting. I was just on a, a panel about founder CEO transitions and there was some data presented that said, said exactly that, that mm. the most successful transitions happen when the founder has a role within the organization, a continuing role within the organization. That's very discreet and different from the CEO but is a, is a well-defined role. It offers continuity for the staff. It offers continuity for partners, supporters, mm. other stakeholders, and it's really important. So I'm grateful that I've had that. Very, very grateful that I've had that. And I hope others will have that too in this role, this type of I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought that. I would have thought the founder needed to get the, get, get cut them. So that's interesting yeah, data. No. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. So Morgan, any final words for us? Any other thoughts that you wanted to share? Just say maybe the last piece is, um, you know, stepping into, into the role of a CEO, be aware of your strengths, mm. be aware of your weaknesses, but don't be afraid of your weaknesses because they can also become strengths. Um, you know, when I stepped into this role, one of the the comments that I heard from the board was, um, you know, we want to make sure you're strong enough. You, you're, you're quite empathetic, but we want to make sure you're strong enough to lead. And what I've ended up realizing is that my empathy is my strength. And especially during this really challenging time during COVID, I think that the fact that my empathy for our team and what they were struggling with was genuine, was seen as a leadership strength um, by the team. And so yeah, I, I would I would leave leave that as just think about strengths strengths and weaknesses, but perhaps not in such a, a black and white sort of way. I do, I do love that too. I love the the your weaknesses can be your strengths, and I love the example that you gave. Um, and we're so quick to be afraid of our weaknesses, um, try to hide them, or self talk talk negatively to ourselves about them. So I love that offering of what if your strength, your weaknesses were really your strengths. So I think that's a beautiful place to end. Morgan, thank you so much for, for being here with us, for okay. sharing your experience, um, for giving me a couple of good things to think about. And uh, yeah, best of luck. Thank you so much, Lynn. I really appreciated the time. Thank you. And the rest of you, we will see you at the next podcast. Take care.